Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Issa. I'm um, a PhD student at King's College London. Um, and I'm going to present to you today some joint work with my supervisor, Blanca Horvath, who is a professor at the University of Oxford. Um, she was hoping to join today, but she is having some technical difficulties. Um, so if she manages to jump in, she may say some words, but otherwise, um, I will be giving our presentation today. And the presentation today is a follow up to work which we have completed previously. And it is on clustering uh, market regimes, which we'll discuss what they are in a second, and in particular, uh, clustering market regimes in a pathwise setting. So not just looking at um, Euclidean space uh, variables, but instead variables that live in path space. Um, okay, so just as a brief introduction to give a flavor to what we're looking at, um, I think we are all relatively aware of the fact that uh, financial markets tend to behave differently at, uh, in different um, circumstances. Um, and the idea behind this research is that we want to be able to come up with a way which hopefully is uh, non-parametric, but is able to uh, notice when these um, changes are occurring and also be able to classify um, into groups what these changes represent. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, in a way which doesn't assume any underlying model. Um, so we call these different states uh, regimes, which are essentially latent states, where these latent variables, latent as they are unseen or cannot be observed, um, tend to specify the or do specify the market dynamics um, when they are um, get for a given fixed latent variable. Um, so the applied problem that we are interested in here is if we have a path, if we have path value data, which you can think of as a discrete stochastic process, so basically just a sequence of, of numbers that might live in um, a high, maybe, you know, maybe RD. So uh, you have, say, for example, D assets that you're interested in considering the regimes between. We want to figure out a way of how to, in some sense, best group this collection of um, observations into separate regimes, assuming that the process behaves differently over that time. And also, as we have incoming data, we want to be able to um, be able to detect if we have changed regime, given what we have already observed. So this is kind of the two separate problems that we're going to be looking at today. Um, and I'll just mention quite quickly that previously we have looked at this problem by considering empirical distributions of returns. Um, this is a this turns out to be quite a good way in order to attack this problem. But ideally, we would like to work with paths because they are richer objects which also encode information such as the progression at which events occur. Um, when you aggregate things into an empirical distribution, you're not able to do this. Uh, another reason is that it's hard to scale with dimensionality. This is obviously something which is preferable for certain kinds of risk analytics problems. You want to be able to consider multiple assets at once as opposed to just one. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this quickly. It's basically the mathematical underpinning of why our technique uh, makes sense and why it works. Um, the basic idea is that we have um, a way of comparing, um, I should go back a slide, we have a way of essentially sending paths, which are quite complicated instruments, into uh, a linear space where, where it's much easier to actually work with their encoding. So uh, the whole theory behind why this works is, is, is basically the theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And the idea is that you sort of map your path data into um, some simpler space, and then you perform your analysis in that space, and then you can draw conclusions based on differences observed in this nicer space as opposed to this more complicated infinite dimensional space. Um, the mapping which allows us to do this, this is the mapping that sends paths into this nicer space, is called the signature mapping. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it essentially is a canonical way to extract all relevant features from um, a path. The issue with working with it in practice is that it is actually infinite dimensional. It maps paths into uh, infinite dimensional space. So in practice, due to technical limitations, you cannot necessarily directly work with the signature. Um, however, it does turn out that there is a way to work with sort of um, inner products of signatures with other signatures um, in a way that you are directly working with um, this object. So you can't work with the signature itself explicitly. You often have to truncate it, so you have to sort of cut it off at a certain level. Um, but you can actually work with um, inner products of signatures with other signatures. Um, this object is called a kernel. And not to, I mean, you use kernels all the time in mathematics, but th this one is called a kernel. And 
the important thing about this kernel is that you can use it to define a distance between parts or between collections of parts. So this is sort of where we're going with all of this. Um, that distance is called the maximum mean discrepancy. What it basically does is if you have a collection of paths, um, it uh, basically compares the difference between uh, the mean element from each of those collections in your feature space, which is this um, nicer linear space. So essentially you send all of your, um, for a given collection, you send all of your paths into this nicer space via your feature mapping, which we take to be the signature. And then you look at that the mean element, so the mean, uh, what we call the mean embedding, but basically the mean signature, you can think of it in that way from all your collections of paths. And you do that for both sets. And then you look at the difference between those two mean objects given some norm. And the idea is that if the two collections of paths are the same, then that the difference between those two mean elements will be zero. And if they are not the same, then the difference will be non-zero. So in this way, the MMD is actually a metric on um, probability measures on compact sets of paths which means that um, essentially we can now use it. So I'll sort of, I'll skip over a bit of this because it's just more technical details. What this means is that we can use the MMD to um, directly compare sets of paths that we observe with other sets of, sets of paths. And then we can use this as a method for regime detection directly on path space. So uh, essentially this is just giving the, um, the uh, the technicalities as to how we actually construct uh, these paths. So in particular, if you have a financial asset here, S, which is necessarily living in RD, um, what we tend to do is that we take this path and then we cut it up into non-overlapping segments um, of a given length. And then what we do is we take each of these non-overlapping segments and we group those into what we call an ensemble. So let's say we have a path of length 100 and we want paths of length, let's say, 10. So we chop that path up into 10 uh, segments of length 10. And then um, if we want ensembles of five, we then take the first five paths, and then we shift it forward and take the next five, and then we shift it forward and take the next five, so on and so forth. And then in this way, we end up building a collection of ensembles given one long path that we observe. And it's this collection of ensembles that we are going to analyze in order to be able to detect market regimes. Um, so how do we do that? So we have this, these collections of paths, like I was mentioning before. Um, we want to be able to compare this to something, um, another collection of ensembles. And a classic way that one can do this is by specifying beliefs. So essentially, um, as the practitioner, you say, these are the paths that I'm observing, but I think that paths behave like this in a certain environment. So I want to check to see how similar or how different uh, my beliefs are to what I am observing. So what we do is we uh, essentially create um, our beliefs via whichever simulation or generative model that you decide to use. Uh, it could be a simple specified model or it could be the output of a generator um, trained on data. Uh, we then uh, bootstrap essentially the null distribution of the MMD from these beliefs, so from these collections of paths. And then when we have this bootstrap, we can think of this as our null distribution we can use specifically the one minus alpha percentage confidence interval, or sorry, quantile, as a way of detecting anomaly. So from these paths that I observe, um, if they, and then I calculate the score between that and my beliefs, and if they are greater than this quantile, then we have a indicator for an anomaly. Um, so we're gonna get to an example with some experiments now, so you can see this in action. Um, the first experiment is a relatively simple one. Uh, we take a geometric Brownian motion uh, we simulate it for four years, and what we do is we switch regimes. So we have two regimes. The first one is um, the volatility parameter is given by 0 0.2, and the drift is given by 0. And in the second regime, the volatility parameter is increased to 0 0.3. Um, in this toy example, we make our beliefs uh, just the base case, so this geometric Brownian motion with volatility parameter 0 0.2, and we essentially construct a path where at random times the regime will switch, and it will persist for a random amount of time, and then it will end. Um, so an example of this visually is this image here. So you can see this is the regime changed path. Um, the red intervals indicate when the regime changed to this high volatility regime. And to sort of make it very clear, you can see from this um, log returns plot specifically when the, uh, when the regime changed. Um, 
So again, just as a bit of a toy example, what we do here is we partition this path into collections of seven non-overlapping paths of length 10. And then we um, have to apply some appropriate normalizations, which I won't have time to discuss, but they are um, quite relevant. And we then um, calculate the signature, the kernel, the MMD, sorry, between our beliefs and between these collections of paths that we observe. Um, and this is the sort of thing that we get. So on the left-hand side here, the red parts indicate where the regime change happened. Um, the green parts indicate the standard regime. And the gray line here is the corresponding MMD score as the regime change occurs. So you can see that when we're in this new regime, um, the MMD score spikes, and then it decreases back down again when we go back to the other regime. Um, the plot on the right here gives essentially the percentage time that each path segment, because each path segment belongs to multiple ensembles, it's evaluated relative to the quantile indicator multiple times. So the intensity of the coloring specifies what percentage of the time that path segment was um, supposed to have violated our null beliefs. So the darker the color, essentially, the more often that that occurred. And you can see um, during the regime change, this is um, very intense. So everything is working as planned. Um, so this is a very uh, simple example. We're just going to talk quickly about some uh, issues. So for example, what if we don't want to specify beliefs? Um, well, one of the things you can do is you can essentially evaluate the MMD from the paths you are currently observing with paths that you have observed in the past. And if the new paths that you have observed are different in some sense or um, anomalous, then the score should spike. And then it will go back down if you've entered into a new regime and then spike again as you leave. So it doesn't give you a score with reference to a particular model, but it gives you a changing score as, um, as time progresses. Um, so an example of this uh, in our GBM example is given here. So you can see um, the first one on the left here is just with one lag. So we're just comparing the most recent ensemble to the one that just preceded it. Um, the one on the right is comparing the last five to the one that we are currently seeing. And but in a sense, it spikes when the regime changes and then drops back down again, and then spikes again when we exit the regime. So this is a good way of indicating whether we have um, exited or not. Um, another issue is to do with having low data, low amounts of data. Um, so for example, let's say you don't have a lot of observations and it can be difficult to partition your paths into enough, uh, to have enough of a collection. Um, one of the ways that we have found this um, seems to fix things is by increasing the dimensionality of the paths that we are considering. Uh, essentially, the long and short of this is that it has the effect of um, increasing the power of the estimation between each of the terms in the signature. So you're receiving a richer representation of the object that you're looking to consider changes in regime between. Um, and just as an example of that, we give um, an example with the Arbogomi model, which some of you may be familiar with, which is a rough volatility model. And we are looking for changes in the Hurst exponent. Um, we perform the same experiment, and we get something like this. So on the left-hand side, these are this is an Arbogomi path, which is only um, unidimensional. And on the right-hand side, we have one which has a um, dimension equal to 10. So you can see that the regime change indicators, although they are present in the dimension is equal to 1 example, um, they're significantly more prominent when the dimension is equal to 10. And you are, in effect, increasing your amount of samples, assuming that there's some independence relation between each of the dimensions. Um, obviously, in practice, that is not necessarily true. But um, just to give you a flavor as to why this works, this is, um, this is uh, a nice example as to why. Uh, so just, uh, just to quickly go through this, um, it is possible to also cluster paths using the MMD, because when you have these collections of ensembles, you can directly uh, evaluate a pairwise distance matrix. Um, so you now essentially, if you have n uh, ensemble path groups, you can calculate a n by n matrix given by the distance. And um, given by this distance matrix here, which is just the MMD between the pairwise samples, once you have this distance matrix, you can pass this to any clustering algorithm that you desire. Um, we didn't spend too much time focusing on the specific one, but if you just use a basic uh, agglomerative clustering in scikit-learn, um, you can achieve something that looks like this. So again, it is related directly to the MMD change, but um, the lines here indicate um, when the, uh, the cluster membership, so the higher one indicates the first one, and then the second one, the bottom one. Um, and again, if you, as you increase the dimensionality, this improves.
Uh, so the last one I want to quickly go through in the last five minutes is using this on real data because you know all these toy examples are useful, but we want to see if this works in practice. Um, so what we do is we have obtained uh, daily close prices since the 1980s via um, Yahoo Finance with a selection of equities. And we are going to generate um, the set of ensemble paths, um, as we mentioned previously. And then we are going to um, use this auto-evaluated score, which is this um, score uh, evaluating uh, uh, the ensembles against each other in the past. And we're going to look to see whether this spikes and when this spike, sorry, uh, given these price paths, and to see if this is in some sense um, lining up with our idea of regimes in this setting. Um, so when you do this, um, you get something which I think we can all uh, pretty well uh, agree with. Um, the spikes tend to be the most uh, aggressive um, around the GFC. Um, .com is an interesting period, um, late 1980s, obviously, and um, more recently, March 2020. Um, so uh, you know, if uh, this is sort of checking out with our uh, our understanding as to um, as to what we deem to be these different market regimes, and moreover, you can also use uh, these scores to be able to cluster, like we did with the toy examples. And again, we get if we just select two clusters, then these most extreme periods tend to get separated out. That being the GFC and um, March 2020, um, working as we would imagine. Uh, just as a bit of an addendum, you can also do this with you can do this with any. Uh, it's asset invariant, so it doesn't matter which assets you choose. We just use equities because that's easy to understand. But you can do this with um, cryptocurrencies. You can do this with um, whatever you like. And actually, you don't even necessarily need to do it with returns data. You can put any stream data related to your problem um, into the model, and it will still be able to give you regime spikes because it is essentially comparing. Um, relative to how that data um, was previously. So this is with cryptocurrencies up until the end of 2021. And um, and you can see the different cluster membership there as well, and the spike as well. Um, OK, so just wrapping up now. Um, so this is just a hybrid methodology that you can use for detection and that you can also use for clustering once you have observed all your data. Um, there are. Uh, two different ways that you can attack the problem in terms of the detection problem. The first is with beliefs, which you can have. Um, we didn't have time to mention today, but you can have uh, multi-class beliefs, and you can um, basically track how your MMD score changes according to all of your different beliefs, and that can be a useful way to detect different kinds of regimes. Um, the further topics of research that we are looking at, um, and that we are hoping to release um, some things on soon, is um, some more statistical analysis regarding the uh, variability of the MMD estimator with the signature kernel um, for a fixed level of sample size. Um, and we are also looking at thinking about how to optimize certain scaling and path trans um, trans transformations given uh, input data from, uh, from the path objects that you observe. Um, so thank you all for listening. I hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation. And uh, I'm going to pass on now to uh, Mariam, Wim, and Eric to give their talk. Thank you very much.